Thank you for coming. Let's pray together. Lord, we really want that to be true. We want our hearts to be able to sing how much we love you. And Lord, uh, sometimes that's hard for us. Sometimes we are, we're not feeling it. We're not experiencing that. But we want to want that in our lives. So help us to be able to simplify and bring us, bring us back to that purity and simplicity of just loving you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. You know, we are just prone to move from simplicity to complexity. We just do it. It doesn't matter. Could be some of the most simple things in life, like the simple reality that, you know, God says we need to forgive people. And then we think, oh, that's very simple. I just need to, that person hurt me or that person disappointed me. I'm going to forgive them. And then we will, and then we'll think about it for a while and we'll begin to come up with all of these kind of um, reasons and rationales and whatever, excuses, exceptions, deletions. It doesn't matter whether it's relationships, whether I need to just love this person. And it, but, and we add that, things get complicated. It could be all kinds of things that we do in our lives that we make things complicated. And so today I'm going to try and do something a little bit different. It worked okay in the earlier services. If it, if it bombs in this service, it's got to be your fault, I'm sure. Uh, but um, we're going to use the whiteboard, which is a little bit old school. And then, um, and then also try and kind of work with the, um, with, the, with the technology over there. You know, I want to start with this question that is a, a just kind of a basic question come back to the basic, simple understanding. What does the label Christian mean? What does the label Christian mean? Because this can be even confusing. Sometimes we think we understand it, but it's confusing because so many things in our time in our culture are called Christian. You got Christian TV, you got Christian radio, you got Christian books, you got Christian publishing houses, you got Christian buildings, whether they're church buildings or something else. You got Christian organizations, you got even Christian diets. I haven't been doing it, but anyway, uh, allegedly Christian diets based on something. And there's Christian music. And there's Christian, even in, in when people talk about history, they'll talk about the Christian nations. There's Christian clothes. Um, there's, whole, there's whole segments about, you know, of people that have Christian T-shirts. There's Christian jewelry. There's Christian everything, seems like. I mean, my friend used to kid about Joseph, Joseph and Mary's spice racks and John the Baptist shower curtains, you know. So, um, you know, when I was saved, when I came to know Jesus, I was just surprised. <laughs> I was just so surprised and happy, I didn't really think very much about it. It was very uncomplicated. And I was doing stuff when I look, think back on it. I mean, I, was, I had been reading the Bible before I finally came to faith. And, and uh, I'd gone to church a little bit. And I was, you know, I was praying. I mean, praying all the time. And I didn't really, it wasn't really because I, like somebody had said, do that. I just did it. It was just kind of uh, because I loved Jesus and I was so shocked and so surprised and so happy that he had forgiven me and helped me. And then I, I, I started going to a church and there was a lot of well-meaning people and these were like really good people. And they began to tell me things that I should do, like you should do this and you should do that. And, and so I just did them. And it, it wasn't that they were trying, they were actually trying to help me, but I, it wasn't that they were trying to like trip me up, but they just told me to do this. And one person would tell me to do that. And, you know, I do this. And, and uh, over time, uh, I just did them. And they just gave me more and more stuff, more and more Christian, quote unquote, 
things to do, and it was always by people that I think really meant well. The problem was I got more and more weighted down with stuff. You got to read this and you got to do that. And of course, then I was in being educated and I was in theological education for years and years and got more and more stuff added to the list. And I got weighted down with the list and you need to do it this way and you need to do it this much. And, and then, I, then I would feel guilty when I didn't measure up and, and then it would just be this huge load of stuff. And it was all stuff I should do or not do based on whether or not it was, quote, Christian or not. And no one ever said, and, and I didn't have enough uh, probably discernment to ask why in the world I was even doing most of this stuff. I mean, the people told me to do it, so I just did it. And, but as time went on, and as I read and as I studied, I, I couldn't find anywhere in the Bible where I was commanded to do certain things at certain times and certain days of the week and certain uh, quantities and certain uh, approaches. Never said that. Just didn't. It wasn't that the things I was doing or being told to do were bad. They just weren't things that were specified like I was led to believe. And they just, people just say, well, just do this. It's going to help you. And they're Christian. And uh, you should just do them because they're Christian things to do. But no one, ever, and nor did I ask. I don't blame anybody. But no one ever showed me the connection between all the stuff I was doing, all these, these different practices I was doing, and the simplicity of just loving and being shocked and surprised and happy at the grace of God in my life with just loving Jesus. I, I could, they never showed me the connection. As a matter of fact, the more stuff I got, the less I had that. And what I came to understand as I read a little bit more, which was a surprise to me, that did you know that the term Christian wasn't even what believers in Jesus were originally even called? That term that has taken on a, become the title to almost everything, or so many things, has been, been tacked on to all kinds of good and bad things, wasn't even what Christians were originally called. As a matter of fact, it happened pretty late. The church had already been established for some time before this label of Christian came along, and it wasn't widely used. As a matter of fact, it's really only mentioned in the Bible one time. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter eleven twenty six, 26, it says, And when he found him, he took him to Antioch. And for a whole year, the two met with the people of the church and taught a large number. It was at Antioch the believers were first called Christians. It's an amazing thing. Did you know what, what before he was a Christian, before he was Called it, considered a Christian. I don't know of any scripture, I might be wrong, but I don't know of any scripture where Paul ever self-identified himself as a Christian. It's not a bad term. It's just come to mean a lot of other things. As a matter of fact, when Paul, before he was a, a believer, as Saul of Tarsus, he identified followers of Jesus, or believers in Jesus, in this way. In Acts chapter 9, he asked for letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus so that he found, if he found any, any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Did you know that, that this idea, Paul talked about people who were believers in Jesus as followers of the way. Now this, I'm not, I'm not making a pitch to rename anything this word this term the way has been hijacked and utilized by cult groups and all different types of groups but paul even used it about himself this idea of a way he said in acts 24 14 however i admit that i worship the god of our fathers as a follower of the way which they call a sect i believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets paul self-identified himself in this way the way 
The fact is this, folks, and this is not meant to be like, you know, like technical, but it's an important distinction. Did you know that nothing, the only thing, to answer the question, the only thing that can really be called Christian is something that can have a relationship with God. Buildings can't have a relationship with God. Countries can't have a relationship with God. It's, uh, you know, your car can't have a relationship with God. Uh, music, even though there is music that is dedicated to the idea of, of, um, of Christian themes and Christian messages, a C note is a C note. It's not a special C Christian note. It's a C note. The only thing that can be actually called Christian in terms of what scripture says, is something that follows Jesus. Some individual, some maybe group that has this relationship with Jesus. It's not a thing. You can't attach it to a thing. You know, um, if buildings were Christians, how do we explain all the buildings that have been turned into pubs? As a matter of fact, a lot of Christian music is just the exact same melodies that came from other uh, venues. You know, Christian ultimately means this. Christian ultimately means being is to follow Christ. That's what it means. And this is the essence of it all. This is where we miss it a lot of times. It's so basic. So let me ask you this. If this is what Christian means, to follow Christ, what is the number one complaint against self-identified Christians? What's the number one complaint? It's okay. This is a two-way conversation. It's okay. What? Hypocrisy. It's true, right? And, and what, what people say is, well, if you are supposedly a follower of Jesus, why do you say stuff like this? Why do you post stuff like this? Why do you, why do you do this? Why don't you follow him then? Why do you do things that seem like you're not following him? And I don't really even believe it. Like if you're a person who is like a little disillusioned with religion or you are a seeker, you're not really sure. I, I, I think we need to be a little bit more honest. I, I, I talk to a lot of people who are, who are at various places. They don't really expect, quote, Christians to be perfect. You know, you remember the old bumper sticker, Christians aren't perfect, they're just forgiven. Well, would you drive a little better? Uh, you know, what I'm saying is, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I didn't, I just threw that in there. Anyway, just stream of consciousness. Anyway, that's always bad, but um, they're not saying, would you be perfect? I expect you to be a perfect everything. They're saying, I expect you, if you, you self-identify as a follower of Jesus or a Christian, that you're believable, that you're at least credible, that you at least aren't a jerk. So, to be fair, why don't we follow Jesus in a believable way? Why, just why don't we? Well, it's a good question. I mean, we do try to manufacture obedience in people. This often happens in church. Uh, I know because I'm a pastor and I've used many of these approaches to my shame. How many of you, is there any teachers in here? Anybody raise your hand if you're a teacher? Have you ever used approach in teaching that you regret now it, it was just really a bad idea yeah I, I haven't either but anyway um i just want to say there was a lot i just wanted to get that confession out while we were at it so i didn't feel too bad but what i'm getting as i'm saying in my own experience there was a lot of things because i was being i was kind of operating like this i was passing it down the line unfortunately and so there's a lot of ways that we think like as an organization or as a church or whatever we're doing that we can manufacture kind of a, a type of obedience that god wants you use guilt a lot of times you know you guilt people you can get people to do all kinds of stuff for, with guilt you know you manipulate them with guilt 
And you know, the problem is, you know that guilt works. I mean, it's, 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 really, it's quite effective. The problem is it has a very short shelf life. After people have been manipulated for so long, then they start to go, eh, I'm sorry, I don't know what that all is, but that isn't, that isn't working. Okay? Or fear. That's also quite popular, and some people really identify with that. It works for them for a while, but fear is kind of the same way. It kind of burns itself out. When you tell people, if you do this, you know, this and this is going to happen to you, you know, God's going to kind of get you type thing, and then they go do it a few times, and a lightning bolt doesn't fall out, you know, come from the sky, or they don't have a grand piano dropped on them. They generally kind of think, hey, you know, I, I don't really know that that whole fear thing is uh, a, immediate God smashing me is really legit if they're thinkers. Bribes actually are quite popular. I mean, kids, if you memorize your verses, you all get $100. No, it's more like, you know, like, you know, candy or something like that. And it works. Kids remember Bible verses for um, bad teeth. And metabolic syndrome. Bribes work. It could be thrills. A lot of times this happens in church, you know, in church situations. It's going to be the funnest thing that's ever happened in your life. We're going to have this and we're going to have that and dancing ponies and everything. It's going to be amazing. Church is so amazing. The problem is you always got next week's show. And so that can only, you know, there's a diminishing return on thrills oftentimes when it comes to obedience. Because a lot of times following Jesus isn't as thrilling. It's just difficult. You know, you want to do it, but sometimes doing stuff isn't thrilling. Sometimes loving people isn't thrilling. Sometimes forgiving people isn't thrilling. Sometimes accepting people and being patient with people isn't thrilling. But another way that we can try and manufacture um, manufacture obedience or following of Jesus is approval because people are so starved for approval a lot of times that we just pour on the approval. Oh, you're just so great. You're the greatest. We can never do it without you. We're going to give you a plaque. We're going to name a wing after you, whatever. And this stuff goes on everywhere. It's all, it's, it's totally, it gets into our, our whole culture. But the problem is, is if the only reason that you are following Jesus is because you're being guilted or feared or bribed or thrilled or approval or you're afraid of being rejected or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's not really following Jesus anyway. It's completely backwards. So why don't we follow Jesus in a believable way? And why is it so hard? Because Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He wasn't saying, this is miserable, this is terrible, but God will help you. And what can we do to joyfully, to get to the point in our life, or maybe come back to the point in our life, where we joyfully and spontaneously follow Jesus into whatever he leads us in. You're where he leads you and how he leads you might be different, but I can, I can be okay with that. What, what can we do? Because that's what it is. It's about following Christ. That's really this, what this is all about. It's not following me or following the church or following whoever or following some dude on TV who wrote a great book and it's the latest thing you're regurgitating. It's following Christ. Because you see, the whole life of faith is a life of following Christ from the very beginning to the end. So let me give you a, a, just a kind of a very, very small snapshot of what Scripture says. You know, Mark 1.17, first book that we know that was written in the Gospels. It's very, it's very trimmed down. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. It was following that defined them. Mark 1.20, immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they went away, and they followed him. Mark 2.14, as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in a tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. Mark 8.34, and he summoned the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
Follow me, he said. Mark 10, 21, looking at him, Jesus felt love for him, and he said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give it to the poor, and when you have and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. He didn't say follow somebody's list. He said, follow me. Get this stuff out of your life that's in the way. The next day, John 1, he proposed to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and Jesus said to him, follow me. John 10, 27, Jesus laid out the defining reality of what it really means to be a believer in him. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they do what? Follow me. John 21, 19, you remember this story? Here, Jesus um, was talking to Peter. It's toward the end of the book of John. And he's told Peter, you're going to die a martyr, and kind of indirectly. And so Peter's walking along, and it's John, the apostle John's with him. And he said, and this he said, signifying what kind of death he would, he, he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to Peter, follow me, okay? And then Peter's thinking this, well, what about him? What about John? Huh? I mean, you've laid this pretty heavy journey out for me and my following. What about this guy? Listen to what Jesus said. Isn't this what we do? We get all focused on, some, well, how come I have to do this? Or what, what about, I'm, I'm going to get focused on somebody else's walk with God. Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. You know what he say to you when you get focused on everybody else's following? He says, why don't you focus on what I told you to do, Okay. Let him walk his walk. And in Acts chapter 12, here's the Apostle Paul. He's being delivered by an angel. Listen to the same. It's, a, it's starting to sound a lot the same. And the angel said to him, gird yourself up and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. This is the whole life of the believer is to follow him. From the very moment you trust him to the day you take your last breath. It's about following you see, the entire call became the, of what became known at, with the title as Christian was just the way of following Christ, the simplicity of following Christ. So why don't we follow him in a way that at least our critics would, even though they might not agree with us and they might not believe the same way, they would at least say, well, they're believable. And why is it so hard? What can we do to do it more joyfully? And spontaneously, why don't we follow? Well, here's what the Bible says. It says, Jesus said it like this. He made it very clear. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus kind of answers the question. He says, why don't we follow? Well, your real problem is you just don't love me. No, you love me. Maybe you love me a little bit. As a matter of fact, this in the Greek, John 14, 15 it says, when you really get around to loving me like you ought to, you will follow me. You'll do what I said. You'll go where I lead. When you really get around to loving me. So why don't we follow? Well, the real problem is that you either don't love him or you just don't love him enough. You don't trust him or you don't trust him enough. So how do, I always ask this question over and over in my mind. So, okay, if love is the problem, how do I get to where I really love God more? How can I get to where I love him more? So let's look at this. We're going to take a little bit of time to find out what can help you love him so that you will, the, the following him won't be this big burdensome thing that you will actually follow him out of heart of love. So let, let's, let's do this. What are things... You guys help each other out with this and help me out. What, what is something you do or someplace you go or something you, you want in your life, you make room in your life for that helps you be aware of God's, of Christ's love? What are things you do? Okay, okay, pray. So you pray, all right? Anything else? What else? Yeah, and... and 
let me just set the table like this. Guy in one of the early service, he rides his Harley. So this is not like, don't just give me the stock answers. You can give me those because those are valid. But he says, when I'm out riding my Harley, I'm by myself and I'm going down a beautiful road. I just have a, it makes me really have a sense of the presence of God. Now me driving his Harley would not do that. That would not work for me or anyone else, okay? I might have a sense of the presence of God. It'd be more like, oh, God, help me, because I never was very good on motorcycles, okay? But um, anyway, somebody else. What else? What do you do that helps you, uh, that, that stirs up your affections? Go ahead. So creation. You know, we forget what a big part of 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 our lives creation should be remember all the hymns oh lord my god when i in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hand has made i see the stars i hear the roaring thunder thy power throughout the universe displayed i mean it's everywhere in him hymnology the Bible says the invisible attributes are clearly seen in that which is made so that we're without excuse. I mean, the, the whole idea of creation or, or spending time in nature is a huge way that many of you may, may connect um, as a way to like have a sense of the awareness of the greatness and the goodness and the love of God. All right, somebody else? Go ahead. Singing. So music, singing, music can really help you it can speak to you it can encourage you but you know i just want to say you guys need to up your game when you're singing together i mean sometimes you guys it doesn't sound like it's working okay but singing can and maybe it's certain songs that that resonate with you or certain types of songs but it's not always just singing there's all kinds of music there's like classical music sometimes that can be really moving or instrumental music and the best music of all banjo music of course <laughs> is like, you know, almost takes you right into the Holy of Holies. Um, um, don't shake your head, AJ. I saw that. Um, but uh, anyway, but you, it's very subjective, but you, you, you figure this out. Hey, this really helps me to have a sense of, of an awareness of God. It, it cultivates that. Go ahead. Talking to God. So, Not necessarily praying, but talking. Okay, so... And, and I think sometimes what we do, I think what you're alluding to is a lot of times your prayer life turns into just saying prayers. But prayer really is to be talking to God, communing with him, having this conversation. Go ahead. Okay, the word. And this is very important. Now, I want to say this to you. Some of you, the way you approach the Bible, it's like eating bran with no milk or sugar. Okay, it's nutritious and has lots of bulk, but it's dry. And um, the reason for that is, is because the way God's word is designed is it takes the work of the Holy Spirit to apply it to your life. It takes what we used to call, it was a common understanding, illumination. It's not just rote memory or just, you know, putting a phylactery on your forehead, thinking that's kind of like a magic charm. But the scripture is the word of God, the spirit of God takes the word of God, the scriptures, to the person of God to show them the will of God so that you can follow God. And you ever have that happen where you're reading your Bible and then it's like, bam, that's like, it's just like God just said, I'm talking to you, daughter. I'm talking to you, son. This is about you. This is about what you need to do. This is what I want you to do. So that's important, but that's a very important way that God makes his presence known to us. Okay, anybody else? Go ahead. Giving. So giving. Giving can be a big aspect of in your worship and the experience that you have out of that. You, you, get to, you get to express something that is after the nature of God. God is always giving. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above. All right, somebody else. Go ahead. So fellowship. Go ahead. What was it, Elias? Giving money to the poor. Giving money to the poor. Exactly. That's very good. And fellowship. And fellowship um, is, is not to necessarily be confused with another way that we feel the awareness of God. Eating. <laughs> Which 
is good. You should eat together. It can be a part of that. It's a very common thing that we take a meal together and we spend time together and we talk to each other. Jesus did that. And so the fellowship, now, now folks, fellowship is more than showing up for, we, we, we will always hope, we always wish, all of us pastor type people, we always think, well, you need to you know, show up for fellowship. You need the fellowship. I just want to tell you that not every time you go to church does it happen, right? It's not automatic. It requires you to connect. It, requires, it takes some time. Fellowship isn't like poof, poof, you know, mix in a little bit of this. And um, what I'm saying is, but this is important. There are times in relationships that you have that really just, you just sense a closer, it helps you have a deeper sense of God's presence and God's love in your life. Now, let's be honest. There's some relationships that don't, right? Like if every time you come hear me, uh, hear me preach, you want to, you know, uh, you know, join the atheist society, that's probably a bad sign. We're going to have to work on that. I need to make some adjustments, or maybe you do, or we do. But what I'm saying is it's supposed to help you. All right? Okay? Somebody else. What else? Go ahead. I like to take a long drive. Oh, that's so right. A drive. I have had God speak to me so many times while I'm just driving with no radio or just quiet. I don't know why. I was driving to do a funeral the other day, and it was a couple hour trip and it's just so God just really ministered to me I was able to pray for all kinds of things and talk and it was just very very uh, and I've had God to speak to me very powerfully in times like that I, I don't really know why it didn't seem to matter whether I was driving a junker since most of them were but anyway um, it didn't seem to matter and, and I didn't have any music on just quiet so I understand what you're saying all right somebody else what's that so forgiveness is an amazing thing that happens when you really forgive people. There is, it's, it's one of those other things that you, uh, you let your little petty gripes and your arguments for your right to be angry and to hold yourself hostage, and you forgive, and what that does is you get in some way to resonate what God's like, because he's doing that all the time. Forgive one another as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven us. If you don't, you miss out on the presence of God. Go ahead. So through your kids, all right? Then that's true. We can learn a lot about what God is like through our kids. We can, and, and uh, just remember, God had two perfect children, and look how they've turned out, okay? I just want to remind you of that. You gotta be realistic. It, this, this can backfire on you, though, Trishiana, because sometimes what we are led to believe, the same idea, throw in three Bible verses, psh, 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 you know, a little bit of special this and a little bit of special that, and, and mix well, and your kid <laughs> pops out, you know, they're in ministry automatically. And that's just not how it works. So I think that though these things matter, it matters what you do with your kids and how you relate to them. Your kids can teach us a tremendous amount about the grace and love of God, Right? You know, okay, yeah. Yeah, having kids, but, but I want to tell you, if you want to know, uh, Jesus used the analogy, he said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more can God, God is perfect, he really does love you. He can speak to you. You know, we have, we have many, many times in our lives with, in our relationships where it's hard for us, and this is where when we learn to be gracious and we learn to be forgiving, we get a little glimpse of what God is like. All right? Somebody else? Go ahead. So grief can cause you to have an amazing awareness of God, and that's true. Loss, you know, oftentimes we can just kind of float along through life, and then when we have this big loss, we have some suffering and some heartache. Well, all of a sudden we draw near to God, and then we find out that when we draw near to God, he draws near to us. All right, somebody else? Maybe one more. Anybody else? Go ahead. Serving. So serving, and that's really true. Sometimes um, this is a way that it just kind of jumpstarts you. You're like, you have a sense of that God is pleased with this. This is what he wanted me to do. And God puts the affirmation of his, a sense of his presence in the middle of that, that you're just doing it. You ever done something you just didn't want to do it and you didn't want to do it and you're putting off doing it and you're just like dragging your feet and then finally you say, oh, all right, God, I love you. I'm just going to do it. I don't even know how this is going to work out. And then what? 
then when you do it many, many times, I know it's not always true, you say, oh, I'm so glad I did that. I feel so much better. I just, it was just like God just took care of all of it. So this happens, and we could go on and on. And I say all this, these are all just ways. The purpose of all these things is important to understand. The purpose is these practices that we ask, that we do, we have to ask a couple of things. Does it work for you? Not does it work for me, because what's going on in my life might not be the same as you. This is a very sad thing, that what I call the industrialization of spiritual growth, that we think that we can make everybody do the exact same thing and they're all gonna get the same outcome. Don't get me wrong, I think that things can be helpful, but it just doesn't work. I mean, I've been pastoring for almost 40 years. It just doesn't, it doesn't pan out like that. You take a class, three or four people get something really great out of it, and some other people get some good out of it, but it doesn't have the same impact because everybody's at different places. Does it work for you? And then ask yourself this question. Why are you doing this stuff? All these things. Why are you doing it? I never really thought this through. I was sitting uh, one day. I, I don't know about you, but I like a wood fire, okay? I'm just that that person. I'm pretty sure that if, if I pass on, one of the first things my wife will do is put in a propane stove <laughs> because it's clean and it's, you know, you know how you start a fire? Click, okay. But I like a wood fire for all kinds of reasons. I'm just kind of old school. So I was sitting before the fire and this thought came to mind that was very encouraging to me. If you leave the wood on the embers long enough, the fire will come. The idea there was even in something as simple as that, the Lord saying, if you do this, if you are in proximity to the, and aware of God enough, something's going to happen. These things are to help you be aware of Christ. And you say, well, that, is that, why is that so important? Because the entire Christian life is rooted in this. Your day-to-day -day walk has to be rooted in this or it's not even a following. I mean, think about what Paul said. This is profound, so don't miss this. He says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Did you know that the average churchgoer thinks exactly the opposite of this? Here's, what, here's the way we, it comes down to us. Not intentionally, it certainly did me, and I've been guilty of communicating this. <sighs> Do not carry out the desires of the flesh. Get your life straightened out. Get cleaned up. Get holy enough. Get disciplined enough. Get serious enough. And then maybe you can walk by the Spirit. How's that worked out? You just get good enough. Then you can have this intimate, close awareness of God's presence. You just clean yourself up enough and get holy enough and serious enough and disciplined enough, then you can walk by the Spirit. That's exactly the opposite of what Paul said. As a matter of fact, he was addressing the lie in the whole book of Galatians. They were thinking they passed all these rules and regulations and all these special things, then that's going to do it. But he says, I say, walk in an awareness of God's presence and his love for you. That's what walking by the Spirit is, walking with an awareness of God's awareness of you. And he said, do that, and you know what will happen? You'll not carry out the lust of the flesh. Oh, you won't be perfect, but what will happen is you'll begin to say, I'm walking with the Lord. I don't want to do that. You're, you know, when do you sin? When you forget God. No, it might just be for a few minutes. It might just be you lose your temper, and you weren't thinking about it, and then you go, oh, what was I doing? You walk more and more by the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. You might walk outside. You'll say, I see that coming, that temptation. I'm not opening my mouth. You ever have the Holy Spirit say, don't you open your mouth? Some of you need to have the Holy Spirit say, don't you open your mouth. And you know what I do sometimes? More often than I want to admit. I open my mouth. <laughs> and that doesn't always work out well. Oh, it never works out well. Because when the Holy Spirit says, don't say anything, so much stuff doesn't happen. I can pay attention. I can listen. 
You see, these things are to help you be aware. You know, walking in awareness of God, look at what he says. Paul's describing your daily, daily life. He says, rejoice always. Wouldn't that be great that you're just living out this life of sponta- joyful, spontaneous following of Jesus? Pray without ceasing. Stay in that constant place of prayer. So ask yourself this question about every single discipline you do, whether it's reading your Bible or praying or how you're doing it, listening to music, whatever you're doing, ask this question. Does this make me more or less aware of Christ's love and presence? Does this thing I'm doing, this study I'm doing, or whatever I'm doing, does it make me more or less aware of Christ's love and presence all day? If it gets in the way, you need to adjust it or change it or stop it and do something different. You see... Every practice, activity, or discipline has to be, meet that criteria. Does this make me more aware of God's love and presence? And why is that? Why is that important? It's to help you really do this. It's the, the, the more time you spend aware of God's love, the more time you spend pra- practicing his presence, the more you're going to come to know Christ. You're going to come to know Christ. You're going to come to know him. We all talk about a personal relationship with God, but it's not very personal. And it's not very relational a lot of times. You come to love Christ. You know, it's funny about knowing. You talk to people and they're like, well, he knows the Lord. As though it's like some absolute benchmark he reached. You know, Paul had been a Christian for 17 years when he wrote this. Philippians 3.10, he says, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of the sufferings, being conformed to his death. You know what he's saying? My knowledge of the Lord is not very, it, it is constantly growing. My aware, if you are thinking the same things about God that you thought 10 years ago, your head is in a bucket. It really is. You're not growing. You know, as a matter of fact, this whole idea you're going to get to heaven and you're going to know everything, you're never going to know everything. Well, some of you think you already know everything, but that's not the point. My point is this. You know what? God is infinite. And there is an inexhaustible wonder of knowing more about God. And Paul understood that. Paul said that I might know him. I just want to know him a little more. And I want to know more about his power, the resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. It's hard sometimes, but I want to be conformed to him. You see, so what are you to know about Christ? You know what you're to know about Christ? His amazing love toward you. That's the most important thing you can know. That's the one thing you need to focus on. Not all these rules and regulations and all the attributes of God, and that's all fine. It's all great to know that stuff. But if you're focused on that, you're gonna stay in the bucket. The most important thing you can be aware of is God's great love for you. As a matter of fact, this is what John 14, or 1 John 4, 19 says. We love, we love God. We love in general. We just live lives of love. Why? Because he first loved us. You see, the great call in your life, the challenge is to believe that God loves you. You know, the hardest thing to believe is the most important thing to believe. And the average churchgoer doesn't really believe it very much. And here's what it is. Do you believe that God really loves you? He really, really loves you. That God loves you. For God so loved the world, you, that he gave his only begotten son for you, that if you just believe it, you'd not perish but have everlasting life. That's the most important thing to believe, but it's also the hardest. It really is. That God doesn't just love you. You know, God actually likes you. The Bible says that, the Bible says this, it says that he delights in us. He does. You know, some people think, well, God just has to love me because of the Jesus thing, but he doesn't really like me. He really has, he'd like to judge, he'd like to destroy me. No, that's not true. That's warped kind of thinking, warped theology. The great call and the great challenge is to believe that he really loves you. You know, some people, you know, they don't get this because every single thing in their life, they get a flat tire. God, why? Uh, You know? (laughs) They they don't get their promotion. God, what do you got against me? Why why have you set the array against me? You got a personal problem, huh? 
You see, they really think. They just can't, they don't, they don't believe it. They, every problem they have in their life, the kind of problems that everybody has. They get sick. God hates me. Their kids have problems. They have problems with their kids. God doesn't really care about me. I'm a failure. I'm a huge disappointment. You must not love me. But you need to know, you need to spend enough time with them, aware of Christ. I don't mean to spend in time like chalking up so many hours, 15 minutes, beep, okay, see you, God. No, but doing what you need to do in your life creatively to be aware of Christ, that you might come to know how much he loves you, that you might believe that he's really loved you, And how do you know he loves me? How do I know God loves me? Well, he's proved it once for all, remember? He says, for God demonstrated. He demonstrated his own love. He demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And people go, you know, look, what what more does God have to do? He's already sent his son to die for you. If you just believe it, what do you need? Salami and a sleeping bag as a door prize? I mean, something added to this? I mean, God does give us little tokens of his grace, but the reality is he's already done enough. And the more you believe that God loves you, the more you will love God, the more you will love him. And that the more you get to know him, you, the, the more you get to know about his love for you, the more you're going to love him. You're going to love Christ because he's so lovable. I mean, he's... He said he lives to intercede for you. He's a high priest who's not untouched with the feelings of your infirmities. You are to love Christ. You know, I I love the story in the end of John. You remember the story of Peter? Peter was a super confident guy. And and he said, you know, Jesus is sitting around. He's telling the guys, he said, look, this is how it's going to go down. You guys are all going to forsake me. And Peter, you're going to deny me. How did Peter take that? You know, you'd think, you know, when God's giving you an evaluation, you probably ought to listen and not, like, weigh in. But Peter says, Lord, all these other guys, they'll desert you, but that's, I'm your man. I'm the guy. I will go to prison and to death for you. And he meant it. But you know what, you know what he did? The only thing he did do was deny him. Three times he denied him. Cursed his name. Then he was all crushed and broken. And then later, when Jesus rose from the dead, he said, go tell my disciples and Peter, because Peter was on the outs. So we know that sometime in this period before Jesus ascended, he appeared several times. And I don't know whether he got impatient or Peter figured he'd kind of given up, but Peter goes like this. Look, let's go fishing. And a bunch of the other guys went along because they were fishermen. So they went out to the Sea of Galilee and went, they fished all night, didn't do any good. And somebody's on the, some guy's on the beach and he says, hey, how's the fishing? And they're, oh, we haven't caught anything. He said, why don't you cast your net out on the other side? And they did and they caught this huge load of fish. And they immediately knew that's what had happened before. And they said, that's the Lord. And Peter was like so overcome He stripped off his outer clothes and he jumped in the surf and swam in. And Jesus had like breakfast made and they all sat there. And then after breakfast, Jesus takes Peter for a little walk to deal with some things need to be dealt with, right? So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, You know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Now there's a lot going on in this. There's some word plays in the original language. I'm not going to get down into that. But let it be known to just say this. The only thing, you notice what Jesus didn't say? Jesus didn't say, Peter, cook breakfast and everything. 
but I came out here to get you straightened out. And I just want to say, do you promise? Now remember, three times you denied me. That's three strikes. I'm giving you one more pitch. Do you promise that you will never deny me again and never, never shame the name of the Lord again like you did and turn your back on me like you did and let all these other guys down like you did and make a blunder like you did and lie like you did? You promise? Never says that. Now, we might say that, get all uppity and judgmental. But you know, the only thing that mattered to Jesus was this. The only thing he cared about was this. Do you love me? Peter, do you really love me? I know you say you love me, but do you really, really love me? Do you really love me sacrificially? Do you even love me as a friend? Because a friend wouldn't do that. Do you love me? Do you really love me? Do you know why the only thing that mattered to Jesus was whether or not Peter loved him, and the only thing that matters to Jesus is whether you really love him, is because it's the only thing that ever mattered ever, anyway. From the very beginning of the Bible to the end, it's the only thing that mattered. All your, your stuff that you're all wrapped up in, and maybe it makes you feel important, I don't know. But the only thing that ever mattered to him was, do you love me? Because he knew that if you really love him, he knew if Peter really loved him, he knew if you really loved him, you'll just eventually, sooner or later, love will win out and you'll do the right thing. You'll follow him. Oh, you'll struggle and you'll go back and forth, probably like he did. Because he knew that love is the only thing that can make you go the distance. And you know what? Love shows itself really clearly. As a matter of fact, Peter wrote about it later on Years later, he wrote in his the first letter, and though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him. You greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory. You know, Peter's describing what my relationship was like when I first got saved, just full of joy, happy, surprised that God loves me. As a matter of fact, Paul said it like this in Ephesians 6, 4, after all that great truth he threw out, he said, grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. In other words, don't let anything get in the way. Damper it down, water it down. Replace it with your tactile kind of list. Don't turn love into a list. You see, the more you love, (laughs) the more you spend time with him and are aware, whatever you got to do to be more aware of Christ and to know Christ and his great love for you, the more you know about Christ, the more you're going to love Christ because he's so lovable and it's what he really wants you to do. And the more you love Christ, the more you're going to follow Christ. It'll just happen. Oh, it's it maybe won't jump through all the hoops in the same time frame everybody wants, but it'll happen. You see, Jesus said, you need to, you, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I have, I have a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this will all men know you are my disciples. Love God with all your heart and soul and strength. That's what he said. If you really love him, you'll do it. But the real problem is that we just haven't gotten to the place where we love him enough. It's not that you don't love him at all, at least, but you just don't love him enough. You love yourself, or you love your stuff, or you love these. Like he said, do you love me more than these? I don't know what it is. But the more you love Christ, the more you'll follow him. And the overflow of your life won't be questionable. And the love of God will compel you, as Paul said, the love of God compels me to do what is right and good. Let's pray together. There's no shortcuts to this. There's no shortcuts to relationships, not a three-day seminar, and then boom, marriage is perfect. This is a lifetime of loving God, of doing what it takes to be a lover of God. Lord, we need you. We need to want, we need to, we need you to stir our dead hearts, the wood of our lives to help us 
put it on the embers that you always leave as your spirit fans that back to flame, that we might really love you, that we might know and feel great love for you. We might know and feel great love for you. Lord, you know what that's going to take. So I pray for my friends that as they think about this and as they sift this through and process this through their life, to the simplicity of following you is really the simplicity of loving you that you would help them to not spare themselves or not beat themselves, but to be honest before you. Because who else can we be more honest to than someone who loves us infinitely from everlasting to everlasting? In Jesus' name. I'd like you to look at these, this little blue card, and I know that you guys use these sometimes. If you're a guest with us, this would be really important. If you are, uh, you have a prayer request, you could put that on the back. You have a question about something else, you could put that on the back. But be sure to put your name on there in a way we can contact you. And we pray about every one of these, and we will get a hold of you if it's appropriate. You want us to. But here's some ways you might think about this message. I am trusting in God's love and presence with me. Do you, have you ever really trusted him yourself? I mean, I don't mean if you pray to prayer or jump through some hoop, but I mean that you really believe that he loves you and gave his son for you on a personal level that God loves you. You need to do that. This is, not, this is really a yes or no thing. Secondly, I will base all my practice on if it helps me know and love Christ. That's a good thing. Walk through the things that you're doing. If you're dull and you're, you're kind of dry, the problem is not that, that the well's dried up. You may just be drilling in the wrong place. I commit to make my focus to know and love Jesus. That is a focus God will honor. And pray I will follow Christ from a known and felt love. And you know what? I don't know about you. I, I, there's many times where I don't necessarily feel much. There's a lot of times like that. I know God loves me even when I don't feel it. But you know what? I want to feel it. I want to feel loved. By God. I, God gave me a, a, a physical being. I'm not just a walking intellect. I have emotions. I have desires for God. Desire for God is an emotional thing. It's okay to want that. By the way, God wants you to want it. So when he says you've left your first love, that's what he's talking about. So it's okay to ask, God, I want to know and feel your love. And you know, I believe that's a prayer God will answer.